Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to what will be the first of a new series of webinars on, on slavery. Our first series, which some of you will have taken part in, was on the British struggle against slavery and the slave trade. And our second series, beginning today, is going to be on a more general history of slavery over the ages. And uh, we, um, while I'm introducing our speaker, who doesn't really need any introduction, some of you are still coming, uh, are still joining us. So um, I'm, in a sense, giving you a few minutes to do that. Uh, and I'm, uh, and just let me begin by welcoming our speaker today, Professor Jeremy Black, who uh, is, of course, very well known to most of you here, if not all of you who are taking part in this as one of our leading historians um, who's written on a remarkable range of topics. But I think what one could say, uh, at least I hope I'm right in saying, Jeremy, that your, your real speciality is the 18th century, although you've ranged very widely outside it. And one of your recent ranges, as it were, has been, uh, has, has been the history of slavery. And, uh, and that's what you're going to bring us into today. So welcome, Jeremy, and thank you very much for taking part in our, in our webinar. Thank you. Well, what I want to do is, first of all, welcome everybody to the webinar and also, secondly, to say what an excellent job I think History Reclaimed does and how it's an important part of both the public debate about history and the bridge between the academic world and the wider world, both of which have things to contribute, but more particularly in relationship to each other. Now, as far as slavery is concerned, what I don't want to do is simply repeat what I've said in my books, but what I do want to do is to underline that all of the debate about slavery in the Atlantic world, more specifically with reference to Britain, but also with general for other, generally with other um, uh, uh, Atlantic slaving powers, is most useful if it is understood as part of a general discussion of the history of slavery, what slavery constitutes, and in this case, which I think is a very good topic you've chosen, Robert, of its economics. So let's just start with the last point, the economics of slavery. You might think that that is an easy subject to work out. In fact, far from it. First of all, there are two main categories of slavery. There is what one might call private slavery and public slavery. Private slavery is slavery at the behest of private individuals or institutions. Public slavery is slavery under the authority and control of the state. One of the problems with the British debate on the slave trade and slavery as a whole is that it tends to admit the latter. It tends to assume that private slavery is the only form of slavery and that therefore the profit motive as understood by, as it were, commercial capitalism is the defining feature both of the economics of slavery and of slavery as a whole. Now that is misleading as an account of slavery as a whole. It's also incidentally not completely accurate as far as, as far as Britain is concerned. For example, the British state had its own slaves um, there are good examples of that in the naval dockyards of the West Indies, for example, English Harbour in Antigua, where the museum has quite a lot on the um, on the state slaves. And of course, there are the economics of that activity to consider. But let me just move for a second to the other point I made about public slavery as a whole. Public slavery as a whole means slaves working for the state. And of course, across much of history, a key element in economic activity has not been commercial capitalism, however defined. It's been state capitalism, if you like, or state authoritarian labor demands. So whether one's thinking of state slaves under the, in the Roman world, or indeed more generally in the classical world, who worked in mines producing um, raw materials and precious metals um, for um, the imperial exchequer, whether one's thinking of um, imperial soldiers in Islamic armies, slave soldiers, the armies of, for example, uh, Safavid Persia, Ottoman Turkey, the army of uh, Morocco. Um, 
but that whether one is thinking in more modern terms of slaves at the behest of authoritarian and totalitarian states, um, slave labor, for example, of the uh, of the Nazis or of the Soviet Union, or you might argue the entire population of North Korea at the moment. Uh, these are all categories, groups of slaves, which one requires to think about the economics involved. And in thinking about these economics, there are two principal uh, economic costings to consider. One, the economic costing of obtaining a slave, slave labor force, and two, the economic costing of using that slave labor force and the benefits that might be accrued thereof. Now, if you will think about it already from the categories we've mentioned, it is quite clear that it is very difficult to work out how you define a profit. I mean, how do you define the profits of janissary soldiers in the Ottoman army? And how far do you decide that profit uh, changed or the profit motive changed or the profit parameters changed between, shall we say, the 15th century and the final ending of janissary service in, I think it's 1826. And that's a relatively, as it were, clear cut uh, category because you're dealing with a state there that in relative terms, you know, one doesn't want to push this too far, became bureaucratized. Um, you could argue in modern terms, um, if you could argue that Auschwitz III, the enormous um, uh, camp run of labor running to support the IG Farben works, um, slave labor um, uh, administered by the SS, so that's not Auschwitz II, which was the extermination camp, this is Auschwitz III we're talking about, you can argue that you can relatively easily work out um, the profit, but actually you can't because there's the question of how else um, IG Farben um, would have uh, used its factors of production. You could argue it only went to locate at Auschwitz because of access to slave labor and cheap coal on the Silesian coal field. And you could then also ask questions about how you assess the value of slavery. Indeed, slave labor as a whole is a very difficult um, uh, criteria to assess, particularly if you're using labor, which might otherwise be uh, labor available within a, a capitalist system where uh, you would argue in, in modern terms and economic terms that you would use that labor more efficiently, whereas you would argue that in an authoritarian society where the factors of production are assessed in accordance with political norms and nostrums, often by highly inefficient um, um, as it were, party or uh, bureaucrats, um, you could argue that though the very practice there is highly inefficient. Uh, so let's go back. Consider for a second this question of the actual cost of obtaining labor. We are used to the idea that there is there may well be shortages in particular areas of labor within the world shortage of young people in South Korea or Italy, shortage of medical staff, for example, in Britain today. But we're used to the idea that there is no inherent shortage of labor as a whole in the world. We've got 8 billion people. Um, there may well be constraints for political and other reasons on migration, but there is essentially a, you know, a plethora of, of, of workers in the world. Of course, for most of world history, that has not been the case. Uh, Robert referred to the fact that I'm primarily by origins an 18th centuryist. Uh, we don't have precise uh, figures for the world population, but we'd be thinking that probably in the first decade of the 19th century, it crossed a billion. Uh, it didn't incidentally cross three billion until about 1960. So crossing a billion in about 1805, of that billion, roughly a quarter of a billion in China, a quarter of a billion in India. If you add in then Southeast Asia and Southwest Asia, you pushed up to two thirds of a billion. So the point, point is that in most of the world, instead of there being a surplus of labor, there's a shortage of labor. And indeed, I think one could argue that for most of human history, labor shortage has been the problem. Now, what that means, and this, of course, has been magnified by the 
a lack of mechanization, the low efficiency of the prime ac um, uh, economic activities, which are agriculture, but e equally, for example, communications, you need a large crew to man a ship, whether it's a galley or a sailing ship, et cetera, et cetera. So from that perspective, what one could argue is that until the 19th century, when the situation really changed, what you've actually got is labor shortages. And you have, if you wanted to take a viewpoint on this, you could say you have a variety of labor systems. Some of them we can define as slavery, some of them we can define as serfdom, some of them we can define as indentured labor, some of them we can define as convict labor or controlled labor of some form of that type. Um, and that these provide the ability to recruit and or control um, labor in particular areas. Now that sounds uh, one in which one is actually, as it were, almost decategorizing slavery, but it's worth bearing in mind that there is no hard and fast definition of slavery. Um, in the 1920s, when the League of Nations uh, debated slavery, they found it very difficult to determine whether indentured slavery or for that matter arranged marriages should be considered forms of slavery or not i mean slavery is in a sense like war you might think you know what it is when you see it but is that the case i mean if you're a cuban doctor who is only allowed to work abroad at the behest of the state and they take your passport are you a slave or not it's very difficult to know precisely how we measure these kind of criteria and therefore how we assess the profitability of it so you've got the situation that if we're looking for most of human history, there is the question, do you need to buy your slave, which is one cost? Do you seize them through conflict, which in fact is another form of cost, but the cost is, as it were, internalized within military operations? Or do you obtain the slave because they are the children of slaves you already own? There are other forms. The paying off of debt, for example, is an obvious one. But those would be the three main categories. Each of them has costs. You might think that a slave that is born at the child of an, uh, slaves that you own is the cheapest. But actually, no, because to derive economic benefit from that slave, and I, I'm sorry if this sounds harsh, but we're being realistic here, to derive economic benefit from that slave is, is very difficult, and uh, for until such age that they have a degree of physical strength and a mental ability to understand instructions. And in the meantime, you're paying them um, in terms primarily, obviously, of the mother, you're having lower female work efficiency um, because uh, they are actually uh, pregnant and then mothering the child and so on and so forth. So there is a practical disadvantage in that form. The seizure of slaves, for example, uh, you know, famous quotes in, in antiquity by um, figures uh, writing about Roman generals, such as Julius Caesar, that they seized, or Scipio Africanus, that they seized so many slaves at such and such a point. Um, uh, that, of course, is another way of gaining slaves, because it doesn't always work, um, and there are practical problems. It wasn't a terribly efficient system, that's a major problem, because you need to win at war, and because your slaves are often gained at a position, at a point which is nowhere near where physically you might need to use them. And the actual movement of slaves is a matter of great inefficiency and cost and many deaths along the way. But then there is also the question that um, often um, evasion, avoidance, running away, uh, other such practices made it very hard to obtain slaves in that fashion. So, for example, if you're looking at the Brazilians, the Brazilians um, uh, did take part in slaving raids. Uh, into the in interior of Brazil, but they found that they were difficult and they found that they were increasingly uh, inefficient because of the distances they had to go, the extent of resistance they encountered, and the ability of the indigenous population to evade capture. And of course, more generally in the Atlantic world, uh, if, as far as the Americas are concerned, um, for all the colonial powers, there was the problems that the diseases that they brought with 
killed a lot of the native population and very rapidly um, in places like Hispaniola, Cuba, um, and that also the original population in many of these areas, the eastern seaboard of North America, for example, was very modest. Um, and on top of that, um, the population was uh, able to fight and actually proved to adapt well to Western technology. So eventually firearms and horses spread to Native Americans. So the easiest way to obtain slaves in the Atlantic world was in some respects a costly way, but on the other hand, it was a relatively um, uh, expeditious way within the constraints of what we're talking about, what I'm going to talk about, and that is by buying them from African rulers. Now, uh, there are some cases of slave raiding by Europeans on the African coast, initially the Portuguese, they found it very difficult, very ineffective, and indeed, um, as John Thornton's work on Portuguese warfare in Angola has pointed out, um, um, European methods of warfare in Africa uh, did not prove particularly effective. And one can take that a stage further and point out that the Europeans only really became militarily proficient in Africa in the second half of the 19th century, which, of course, is the very period um, that uh, they have either already ceased slaving um, or are ceasing slaving. So and that's a very interesting uh, point to make. We could talk about that on another occasion. Um, but if we go back, so in other words, the slave trade in the Atlantic world is dependent on cooperation. There's very good work on this uh, by Miller again on Angola, because Portuguese re records are pretty good, on um, cooperation with African rulers. There are networks, if you like, that produce the slaves with best benefit and cost spread around the system, which again means that you're trying to share productivity and profitability. Of course, the slave trade is another part in terms of moving the actual slaves across the Atlantic. Uh, which is only part of the process, is another form of both profit and cost. Uh, profit, uh, because the slave captains expect to be paid. Cost, uh, because there is cost, both in terms of the death of the slaves and the death of the uh, non-slave crew. And also because by the nature of things, uh, you can have glut or shortage in terms of the availability of slaves on the Atlantic coastline, the African Atlantic coastlines. Again, where you then and what you then do with the slaves affects the possibility of profit and cost. And there are interesting examples um, in terms of the actual pricing of slaves, which is an indication of profitability. Now, we're talking now in terms of generalizations. And as I said, right at the outset, we ought to be aware that pretty well every generalization can be um, endlessly contextualized. But for example, slaves in Constantinople, the main Islamic slave market, there are many other Islamic slave markets, but the main Islamic slave market under the, during the Ottoman period, slaves there tended to have the case that women were more expensive than men. Simple reason for that was the use of the slaves. I've already mentioned earlier, massive use of um, uh, slaves for the army, uh, and actually there are janissaries also who are in the Navy and also in court service, but those janissaries are not bought through the slave market. They're obtained by a, um, a rotor system. In other words, each Christian household uh, each 10 his Christian households have to produce a certain number of slaves. So you don't actually have to buy those. Um, in some, from that point of view, the Ottoman Empire is a more efficient slave producer than any of the European empires uh, because um, the state is, as it were, obtaining its slaves from a subject and subjected population. Um, women... Istanbul, or Constantinople, well, a prime reason is the significance in the Islamic world of women for household and sexual duties, uh, tasks, oppression, brutality, however we wish to discuss it and, de and define it. And there are a whole host of reasons for that we can discuss, shortage of 
of women due to uh, polygamy. We can discuss a whole host of reasons for this, but this is difficult, different to what you'd be looking at if you were looking at the pricing of slaves in, say, Charleston, South Carolina, or Havana, or the major slave markets of all in the New World, of course, as people will know the major slave markets in the new world were not the British ones the major slave markets uh, were, the, were the Brazilian ones the biggest slave colony was the Portuguese colony of Brazil and there the overwhelming usage of slaves is for physical labor and the overwhelming um, usage is for quite hard physical labor cotton uh, in, uh, sorry cotton but uh, even more sugar um, are really quite arduous uh, to work on. And of course, we were talking about as far as uh, the mechanization of field tasks are concerned, um, uh, although there's mechanization of processing uh, by the 19th century, most field tasks, we're not talking about mechanization until the 20th century. And so you've got really um, a, a use, a quite arduous use, which requires strong labor and which therefore puts a premium on male labor of late adolescence young adulthood um and um then you have the differential nature of the particular crop the particular crop environment and i say crop environment because other factors are involved than just the crop itself and the economics that produces so in essence for example tobacco the major plantation good from, from the Chesapeake, from uh, Virginia and Maryland, um, is um, requires less physical labor uh, than sugar does. And the result of that is that the death rate among slaves is lower. And therefore, you get an ability to, um, first of all, get slaves, um, slave society uh, producing its labor force internally from its own children earlier and you need to buy in fewer slaves every year from Africa and therefore the profitability is higher looked at differently that is also of course in part to do with the fact that um, the Chesapeake is a less arduous in terms of its climate and disease uh, environment uh, situation than shall we say the areas around Bahia and Recife in Brazil classic sugar country much tougher tougher soils um, uh, tougher climate uh, tougher disease um, uh, you know fever of course um, and uh, again if you go, then go down in Brazil it becomes uh, in in the areas around Rio where coffee production increases uh, dramatically in the late uh, 18th century that is less arduous than um, the, the production of sugar so part of the issue is what you're actually expecting your slaves to do what whether that means that you're going to have a replacement rate problem uh, and indeed also linked to that the issues that are involved in replacing your slaves so for example if you're let us say a french or spanish colony and you're then at war with britain let's just say louisiana in 1759 or martinique and guadeloupe in 1758 then you're in trouble because if you need more slaves and the Royal Navy is the dominant naval force in the Atlantic at that period, and is also incidentally attacking your slaving stations in West Africa, then you're in difficulties. And the, as it were, you have a problem in terms of the pricing of slaves, the price of slaves rises, the internal slave market within the colony rises, the profitability of pl plantation goods falls because you can't actually export them readily. Um, secondly, and linked to that, once you have the slave trade stopped, that doesn't mean that slave trade does necessarily stop. I've done several books on slavery. One of them is on the Atlantic slave trade. And as, as, as you'll be aware, uh, the slave trade continues illegally um, or with, through coll with collusion um, um, in countries after after it's officially ended but the real cost of it is risen and of course you're encountering British in particular naval action uh, determined to try and enforce 
um, international laws and international agreements. And due to all of that, the cost of slavery is rising. So this is a significant issue in the largest slave colony of all, which as I've already mentioned, Brazil, because slaving becomes really after 1850 more when you know, British action has increased very greatly. Um, slave trade becomes much harder um, and the real price of slaves are, is rising. At the same time, the economic system in Brazil is moving towards an interest in different goods. Uh, the government in particular is more interested in what we would call um, the sort of transfer of activity towards manufacturing. They want a more educated labor force. They want a free labor force. And that free labor force is primarily Italian and German immigrants, which they're greatly encouraging by the second half of the 19th century. And that provides one of the context for a lower economic rationale um, for slavery, which of course ceases in the 1880s. But then again, instead of just adopting some quasi-Marxist analysis, one needs to note that profitability and everything else was encoded in terms of political and social values. So in the case of Brazil, the move from an empire to republic is linked to a move of ruling groups towards, if you like, um, a new elite, uh, which has, which likes the idea that Brazil is a non-slave society, likes the idea that they're attracting more European immigrants, um, it, and that and is not really terribly interested in the old imperial links uh, with surviving Portuguese colonies, particularly Angola, but also Portuguese Guinea. And therefore, the relative pricing of slavery has to be seen within the political context. The same if you're looking at totalitarian regimes over the last hundred years. One's not really looking for an economic rationale when one is looking at the Third Reich, Soviet uh, the Soviet Union, other communist states which used slave labor, for example, Romania, uh, building the canal, the Danube Canal across um, uh, the Debrugia region, uh, large numbers of people died or who were slaves in effect, the political, but most of the people listening to this would have been uh, put in labor camps and would have been worked to death um, in this context. And, you know, the regime was not really interested in somebody saying to it, well, in economic terms, I'm not sure we would agree with that. And, you know, we're all Fabian socialists now. And why don't you take our economic advice? And can we give you an honorary degree at the LSE? That would not have necessarily been um, the rationale that meant, meant, meant much uh, in Bucharest or Berlin or Moscow. Um, and indeed, if you're thinking about the situation in the most populous state of the last hundred years in China, and you're looking at economic decisions like the Great Leap Forward uh, between 1958 and 1962, in which, depending on estimates, anything between 20 and 45 million people died, in effect, everybody then was a slave of decisions that had relatively little economic sense in that they assumed a triumph of the will. Um, Mao was interested. Mao combined Marxist economics with a sort of fascistic triumph of the will principle. And the idea that you could will um, uh, modernization and that linked to that uh, you didn't need to rely on uh, established practices of, acad of uh, agricultural provision. Now, in those cases, it doesn't really help to think of a cost-benefit analysis. And I want to close by one or two remarks on reparations. I think I've helped to make it clear why reparations are a foolish idea. Leave aside the notion of inherited guilt, which is an absurdity um, and morally very dubious. Leave aside the absolute absurdity of it. Is, for example, a, um, an octroon to get an eighth of compensation? Or are uh, people who are... Um, refugees here, Ukrainian refugees here that have arrived in the last year? Are they guilty of the, some kind of white privilege? Whatever that's supposed to mean. But leave aside those points. If you just want to look at the economics of rationale, how do you actually assess these um, economic exchanges? 
And how do you assess the beneficiaries? Given that most of the time empire worked, empires worked as a whole on the basis of a kind of shared complicity, if you wish to use that term, but a shared uh, cooperation. African rulers and merchants, European rulers and merchants, African rulers and merchants, Arab rulers and merchants. How are we to distinguish that kind of compensation? Are the descendants of Africans living in Britain are supposed to pay uh, compensation to the descendants of West um, Indians living in Britain and so on and so forth? Um, it's not really going to make much sense to take this forward unless, unless one wishes to deal in endless senses of grievance and anger. And of course, there is the last point, as those familiar with my work will know. Um, I've argued that the factor that distinguishes um, Britain from, let's say, Portugal, which actually um, had a larger slave society in the Americas than Britain did. Um, but the factor that distinguishes that is that Britain had a whole range of criteria from law of contract, um, a nature of a governmental system which uh, elicits a widespread, not universal, it wasn't a democracy, cooperation, but crucially lots of coal. And it seems rather absurd, and Portugal didn't have any of those. And it seems rather absurd to put an emphasis on sugar when one is looking for economic development, when one really should be putting the emphasis on coal. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Jeremy. That was very stimulating and uh, in some ways provocative, at least I hope our audience will think that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A command that you should see at the bottom of the screen, and I will uh, translate your questions into uh, questions for Professor Black. Um, now, I, I, I'm, going to I'm going to start with, with one, if I, if I may. You, uh, on the question of uh, reparations, um, you've made it very, I mean, you... Your, your argument was pretty unanswerable that there is no way in which one can assess in any rational way um, the profits of slavery and the, and the possibility of reparations based on those profits. Um, indeed, Portugal, despite its, its, its huge um, numbers of slaves, is, is poorer than Britain and has been for a long time. So you one might even wonder, and perhaps this is partly a question, is did slavery tend to impo impoverish the slavers in the long run by, by, by shutting off uh, better forms of economic activity? Uh, but what I was wondering is if um, recently the Church of England decided it would, it would pay reparations and other people have made gestures of reparations, they seem not to be based on any kind of rational economic basis in the sense of saying, we as an institution or even we as a family actually made all this money out of slavery and therefore we should pay some of it back. It seems to be purely one of moral or, or virtue, if you like, a sort of moralistic sense that, well, we our ancestors did something that wasn't very good and therefore we should pay something back uh, even if we can't have a rational uh, um, assessment of, of what we might be thought to owe. Do you think? Do you think? Do you think it's perhaps this isn't really a historical question, but is it reasonable for people to make such moral gestures in your view, if they wish to? Well, I'm a libertarian. People, in my view, can do whatever they like, but I think they ought to be wary of telling others what priorities they ought to have, particularly in terms of the complexity of history and the way in which many people who are taking part in this discussion aren't aware of context, aren't aware of comparison, and seem almost to be beating up on themselves. I mean, you know, um, I, I, I would like yeah, I, I'd like to talk about more than just reparations, but if, if one's talking about reparations, as I said, coercive labour systems were very widespread. Um, internationally, of course, there is also the extensive slave trade in the Indian Ocean, there's slaving out of Europe to the Arab world, etc., etc. But there's also a lot of slavery within countries. I've always thought that present-day institutions and individuals who are concerned, as indeed we should be, 
about the wrongs of slavery should stop beating up on the past and talk about the present situation. I mentioned North Korea. Um, there is, of course, in the, within the last 15 years, there's been extensive sl slave-like exploitation uh, within Sudan by of the um, population, both of Dofar and of the South, by um, Islamicists from the North. There's slavery in Mauritania, there's slavery in Niger, and you could argue that, you know, within 10 miles of where you sit and I sit, I'm absolutely certain that there are people being held against their will who were trafficked into this country and are being abused. Most of them are white, they've come from Albania, um, and, you know, the Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, did her utmost with modern slavery legislation to try and stop this and to encourage police forces to do something about it. Now, it would be much better if those people who are so concerned about slavery did something about the present situation, rather than getting angry about something that happened 300 years ago, which we are in no position to do anything about. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask, Can you... I ask one last point. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a tendency to argue that in some way there was an original sin visited upon Africa by the West. This is rubbish. There was, you know, Africa like Europe, like Asia, insofar as those categories can be used for a whole range of societies, didn't need external pressure in order to take part in conflict. It didn't need external pressure to take part in slavery. There was slavery in this country before the Romans. We've got manacles surviving from that period. There was slavery in Africa before, um, the, Euro before the Europeans arrived. And what a surprise. Over the last hundred years, you've seen slave-like brutality and treatment in um, in Europe. Think of the slave component of the uh, concentration camps. And you've seen it in Africa. And the Europeans, by and large, ceased to be colonial rulers um, in Africa in 1975-76, which is when the Portuguese and Spanish surviving colonies went. And you have had massive um, losses of life and brutalization of people in countries such as Congo, Cote d'Ivoire, Sudan, South Sudan, Rwanda, Central African Republic. We can go on since then. So I think we ought to be mature about this. There are faults within our species as to how we treat each other without trying to ass uh, uh, assess or establish some original sin on some basis of a crude anti-white racism. Mm. Um, I want to ask you what is a, a fundamental question and which one of our participants raises. As we're talking about the economics of slavery, could you... Tell us your view of the Eric Williams thesis, or could you say something about that? You know, what, what, to what extent was slavery? I mean, two questions, I suppose. To what extent was slavery responsible for um, the the wealth and the economic development of Britain in particular? I think and I think we, you've really answered that, but maybe you could say it again in a little more detail. And the other one, of course, is the the idea that slavery was really only abolished when it ceased to be economically valuable. In okay, other words, let's the, the take morality, the last. Yeah, let's yes, take the last yes, one first. Yes. It's generally agreed that in the case of the Confederate States of the United States, slavery was still economically, uh, you know, beneficial. There was massive demand for cotton um, in the 1850s and 60s. Cotton production had grown uh, enormously in the first half of the century, which incidentally fed a internal slave market uh, in the sense that the tobacco uh, cultivation was less profitable than hitherto, so slaves were being sold from Virginia and Maryland down into the cotton states uh, like Alabama, um, so that in a sense the end of slavery in uh, the southern states in the United States was not one um, of economic um, necessity, the act absolute uh, opposite of that. 
Um, as far as uh, Britain is concerned, I mean, Williams, I think, came out in 1944. And I think it's fair to, I mean, it's ludicrous that Penguin has re-edited him as if it's an up-to-date observation on the situation. I think it's fair to say that um, it does not reflect current scholarship. I think that's being polite. Um, and that now the argument would be that the major reasons for the end of the slave trade and slavery in the British world reflected um, ideological and political developments within Britain rather than an economic law. And indeed, you can take it further than that. Once slavery was abolished, the uh, West Indies colonies became relatively unuseful, let's just put it like that, to the British Empire, which was a hell of a lot of capital asset to write off. One of our participants asks about the uh, the amount of money paid uh, to slave owners by by the taxpayer, effectively. Um, that's of course, that was a huge amount of money. How, do you have any sense of how that compared with the profits made previously from or need at the time from slavery? I mean, it, as it were, was this a very generous, if that's the word, payment to slave owners for giving up slavery? Or did it sort of compensate them for the economic loss of their workforce, or at least the partial loss of their workforce? Well, I think we to this, to, uh, we this day would regard it as reprehensible and wrong. OK, just as I hope every listener to this, I'm think without question every listener to this to this would regard slavery as reprehensible and wrong there's no two ways about that um if you're looking back to the nature of the 1820s 1830s uh british state what you're talking about is state driven policies and this is by no means the only the only one you can see other examples of that in kind of the tithe appropriation the changes of ecclesiastical revenue as they were nationalized and as it were then redistributed through the church commissioners the idea of the trying to get some sort of relationship between the rights of pre-existing asset holders and it's not nice to say this, but human labor was regarded as an asset um, and the wish to actually get a peaceful and legal means of getting through this problem. After all, the last thing the British state wanted was to have to use force in creating a um, imposition, in, you know, in other words, facing a kind of white settler rising. They really didn't want that. Whether that would have happened or not, I simply don't know. Um, but their view was that this was the best way to move through the situation. And I'm not sure that it really is terribly helpful. I think we can register our moral disapproval. That's fine. Um, whether it was prudential for them to do it, um, I think is an interesting question. Um, my own view is um, it was probably the easiest and quickest way to get political consent to it it sticks in the in the you know in the core for us but i think one can understand why they did it it's often it was often argued at the time and i mean i think this and this argument i mean argued at the time by abolitionists and this argument has been taken up in some ways in, with a different motivation to say well slave labor was not efficient and therefore um, the argument for abolition was essentially one of economic efficiency. Now, you, you, in a way, you, you, you perhaps have argued, well, you, you have argued, you've, as you said very clearly, that the, the, uh, the cotton cultivation in the southern states of the United States was very, very profitable, and there was a high demand for slaves still. But in, in broader terms, do you have a, a sense of whether slave, you know, as we're talking over the very long period, is, is slave labor inherently inefficient or and perhaps well i think it's inherently it's, no so, yeah robert it's inherently inefficient if you've got an alternative and if yeah. the alternative is a free labor force which is one which is willing to do the job but if you don't have a free labor force which is willing to do the job and you need this carried out uh, then there are practical issues as to addressing it. Now, one, one of the things I was suggesting is that the terms of the trade 
altered in the 19th century, partly ideological, spread of a different attitude towards human uh, values, what we might call human rights in some countries, um, uh, spreading different attitudes towards what we would call proto-democracy or democracy or proto-nationalism or nationalism, and economic factors to do with the greater availability of labour and mechanisation. And I think one of the difficulties of economic accounts is they try and, as it were, quantify all of those. I don't think you can readily quantify all of those. But I think those changed the situation in the 19th century. And obviously, if you're looking at the situation situation today where a much of the labor force is highly skilled then if you're dealing with a highly skilled labor force then it's best to deal with a cooperative labor force but obviously if you're in an area of the modern world where the state or others cannot afford the labor force it requires but has access to the coercive control um, then it's not surprising that they may still use aspects of what we would call slavery or enslavement. Mm -hmm. I sometimes My voice make, uh, is starting to go, so I'll take one more, if I may. Okay, this is this is this is this is from me. Okay, uh, and I think we've covered the questions raised. Most of the questions raised by others uh, is um, I, I sometimes think uh, comparatively of the. The, um, the emancipation of Russian serfs, which is roughly speaking at the same time. And although we know serfs and slaves are not quite the same thing, there are, there are similarities anyway. Uh, and yet Russian serfs were in effect made to pay for their own emancipation. At least they were made to pay for land that they were given and, and, and made to pay very, very, very heavily for it and were still paying it by the time of the revolution. So I wonder if, you know, one should not perhaps we think in those terms when we're thinking of the, the mechanism of emancipation in the British Empire, which was, after all, not, uh, it was not loaded onto the slaves themselves. It's conceivable that one might, in another circumstance, have said, well, you know, we, we're willing to free slaves, but they've got to pay, they've got to pay something. You know, okay, there, there's a period of apprenticeship, but there's no, um, there's no attempt to, uh, to, to, to make them pay. I don't know if that was even ever suggested in well, Russia. I mean, obviously, I think it was obviously the, the apprenticeship is the only thing they really can offer because it's a non money It's non monetized is going too far. It's a low monetized society, slave society. Some slaves do have actually uh, significant amounts of money by the end, which is why in some contexts people are able to buy their freedom. But on the whole, they don't. Um, uh, what's interesting, if you want to think about something that's interesting and odd about the British system, and more generally um, about, if you like, Western slavery, is although there are exceptions, 1790s, both the British and the French in the West Indies, we don't tend to go the route of Islamic societies of having slave armies. And that's very interesting. And that might be something that it's worth thinking about. But it actually, and this is my very last point, it actually underlines the problem of compensation and reparation. How do you give somebody compensation for the fact that their great, great, great grandfather might have had to do 20 years compulsory military service? I simply don't know. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> thank you very Bye -bye. much, Jeremy. And thank you, everyone, for your participation. And to those who ask questions, thank you for your questions. Thank you.